if that's okay with you. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody again, and I'm going to pass it to Brandon, and uh, we'll hear a great talk. All right. Well, I appreciate getting the chance to get a little bit more mileage out of this presentation uh, for you know the the uh, work that sort of went into putting it together. Uh, as Wendy mentioned, I'm Brandon Kopp. I'm the director of the Data Science Research Center at BLS, which is a sort of new organization uh, that does cross office uh, data science work and uh, sort of helps build uh, relationships, helps build uh, centralized infrastructure or technology for doing some of these uh, data science projects and also works on, uh, I, I've been warned not to say policy because nobody wants to say that we work on policy stuff, but helping you know, develop best practices and, and sort of uh, help the agency move forward with things about like how we handle uh, machine learning and uh, uh, AI use cases and so forth. And so, uh, but today I'm, I'm not gonna talk about my BLS work. I'm gonna talk about uh, applying traditional and more modern natural language processing techniques to solve a problem. In this case, uh, we're interested in understanding uh, the history of the statistics profession as seen through the lens of ASA presidential addresses. So as Wendy mentioned back in 2020, uh, she set out to do basically that same thing. Her presidential address was focused on the cross-section of history, statistics, and text analytics. Uh, during her talk, she highlighted an R Shiny application that her and I collaborated on that allows users to explore those past ASA presidential addresses. And I'll be talking more in depth about the app today, as well as updates that I've made uh, since then to incorporate some more modern things that have uh, occurred over the last three years uh, in natural language processing. So here's a quick view of the landing page of the application. There are three main content tabs. There's one that allows you to dig into an individual speech one that provides summary statistics or a visualization of summary statistics across all 109 currently available speeches. And there's a tab that allows you to see changes in wording and topics over time. So natural language processing provides us with a lot of tools for extracting knowledge from large bodies of text. And they range from simple to complex, some are model driven, some are algorithmically driven, and some just rely on counting. The ASA presidential app incorporates several of these methods, uh, but today I'm gonna focus on just a couple of them. And we'll progress from simple to more complex, from traditional to modern, and see what kinds of conclusions we can draw about the history of the field of statistics. First, let's talk about the data. So uh, Wendy put in the hard work of collecting the speech text. In total, she was able to find 109 speeches in the Journal of the American Statistical Association and from other sources. The speeches ranged in length from 2,200 words to almost 16,000 words. Uh, some of the text had been scanned and needed to be converted to a machine readable format using optical character, optical character recognition, which can introduce noise. And substantial cleaning was required aside from that, just you know, reading from PDFs is its own uh, nightmare. And uh, not all of those deficiencies were fixed, but we felt like the, the text data was at a good enough point to uh, start doing some of this uh, natural language processing with it. Uh, in addition to the speech text, uh, we also collected metadata about the speeches, the presidents who delivered them, and the conferences at which the uh, addresses were delivered. So let's first look at what word frequencies and regular expressions can tell us about the content of speeches. So at its most basic, uh, NLP involves a numeric representation of text. And the simplest method of that is simply counting up the words. These counts on their own can provide insight into the content of speeches. And we'll approach this from two perspectives. From the top-down perspective, where we gather all of the words for a particular document or a corpus of documents and screen out those words that don't provide understanding, and those are often referred to as stop words. 
And a word cloud or a word frequency chart is a good example of this. And we can also approach this from the bottom up perspective and use regular expressions to extract only those words that we're interested in or key phrases of interest. So the top down perspective can give us insight into the contents of an individual speech. For example, looking at the text frequencies from Wendy's 2020 presidential address, we can tell even without having to read it that it involves presidents and history and that it involves textual information for the speeches. And sure enough, that just roughly matches the overall point of the talk, which Wendy describes as, we will travel through history, exploring issues of our profession by analyzing text as our data. Looking at Karen Kafadar's address from 2019, we can see words related to medicine and disease, as well as clinical trials. And this provides us a sense of the overall focus for that presentation. Looking at an individual speech can be limiting when we're interested in trying to understand issues in the field of statistics that transcend any one speech. We can extract words and phrases from all the speeches using regular expressions and look at their usage across time to see patterns. For example, the word war was more top of mind early in the timeline uh, that we have this uh, data for as World War I and World War II brought many statisticians into government service. And this weighty topic has largely disappeared from more recent presidential addresses. And in the last 20 years of presidential speeches, the mentions of war have largely referenced World Wars I and World War II, you know, referring back to that history part of, of the timeline. Uh, and occasionally references to the Vietnam War and uh, very limited uh, references to Iraq or Afghanistan, even things like the conflicts or calling them, you know, things like that. So uh, this gives one idea of how statistics has changed over time. We can also see that the effect that technology has had on the field of statistics over the last 60 years through the use of language. The word computer is mentioned in almost every speech since the mid sixties, though interestingly in the recent cloud computing era, it hasn't really been, or it's been mentioned less frequently over the last like eight to 10 years. Another trend seen in these word frequency data is the emergence of data science. So aside from an offhanded remark in 1997 about statistics being the data science of the 21st century, data science was first mentioned in 2012 and has been discussed in nine of the last addresses, including Marie Davidian's 2013 talk in which she mentioned it 35 times. Big data, on the other hand, seems to have been more short-lived. So after having been mentioned in six straight addresses and featured prominently, the term hasn't been used for the last five years. And I didn't attend this year's uh, speech, so I don't know if it got mentioned this year, but that's not included in this data set. So next we'll look at topic modeling. So topic modeling has been around for decades and is still commonly used in NLP workflows. Topic modeling allows us to go beyond individual word frequencies and identify collections of words that frequently appear in the same text together to form latent underlying constructs or what we'll call topics. For example, in a collection of sports news articles, you might expect to see words like court, player, hoop, and shot appear together frequently. And the co-occurrence of these words should allow us to identify a topic that we might label as basketball in this imaginary corpus of news articles. So topic modeling is particularly useful in situations like the uh, ASA presidential addresses, because we can expect that while a speech might have, or a speech may have an overall theme, it will likely incorporate multiple topics. Topic modeling allows us to associate a single speech with multiple topics. And we can use latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA to identify our topics. And LDA produces two matrices as part of its output, one that provides associations between words and topics. And this can help us understand what each of our topics is meant to represent. And it produces another matrix that provides associations between documents and topics 
And this is how we come to represent each document as a collection of latent topics. The number of topics you end up with is the result of iteration and experimentation. Ultimately, you'll know when you're done with this experimentation, when you form topics that are largely coherent, and you can assess that by looking at these word topic associations. The word topic associations should have minimal overlap in terms of these top words. Uh, I'll note that, uh, that all of I'm showing here in this uh, visualization are the top 10 words for each topic, but really uh, all words will have some uh, degree of association with each topic, but uh, there'll be some high loadings for a subset of those words. And so I settled on 12 topics for the ASA presidential address uh, application and, and visualizations because these groupings of top words started to make sense together. And I felt like if I added you know, 15, 20, 25, that it would really start to lose the thread and people wouldn't be able to understand what all the topics are meant to represent. So I made a, uh, a sort of executive decision to stick with 12. Uh, to make practical use of these topics though, I had to assign some sort of topic label to each, some sort of human readable, uh, you know, summary of what each of these topics is meant to represent. And so I tried to come up with some sort of label that made sense. Uh, for example, this first topic is pretty clearly health related. Uh, you can see words like health and cancer and medicine. The second topic features forecasts very prominently. It has forecasts, forecast, uh, and forecasting. It also has uh, you know, uh, predictions and so forth. So it's a bit of a a, a bit of a mixed category, uh, but I did my best to assign uh, the a topic label and that's, you know, <laughs> you do your best and you move ahead. So we can now look at each, uh, at the individual speeches and attempt to discern their meaning by the topics they are associated with. So once again, we can start with Wendy's 2020 speech and it's most clearly focused on the topic that I labeled as association largely because of the references to the ASA and to presidents. But it also has a mixture of other topics, which makes sense because the whole point of Wendy's talk was to explore what is in uh, past presidents' talks and what they focused on. So it's understandable that it's gonna have this mix of topics. Looking at Karen Kafedar's uh, address from 2019, it's much more clearly related to the topic that I labeled as health which as we saw earlier, a number of mentions, uh, has a number of mentions of cancer and clinical trials and so forth. Uh, she also talked about the emergence of data science and we see that reflected in that topic's loading. Similar to the word frequencies, we can view these topic loadings across time to spot trends in the field. And this time, instead of changes that perhaps reflect different language being used, we can see movement in more general ideas. For example, we can look at the variability in the topic that I labeled as economics. And it was a frequent topic in ASA presidential addresses of the early 20th century. And it makes sense that unemployment and the functioning of the economy would be top of mind around the time of the Great Depression. Uh, but this also likely reflects greater diversity in the fields that statistics has been applied to over time. And so economics sort of lost its primacy as, as a focus of statistics uh, and these presidential addresses. Uh, economics has been less prominent in the last 60 or so years, with the exception of Janet Norwood's 1989 address, where she covered uh, economic statistics and the work of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And you can see that reflected with this spike here. The last 20 to 30 years have been marked by the increase in the discussion of the topic that I labeled as profession, which is admittedly a bit of a miscellaneous category, but it captures the discussion of jobs, careers, leadership, and uh, editing journal articles, writing journal articles, that sort of thing. Uh, ASA President Lisa Lavange's 2018 address entitled Choose to Lead uh, uh, right here is the most focused example of this topic. And as we saw with the individual words, we can also see the, the topic of big data, data science, or really the, the larger topic of technology and new methods 
uh, coming into greater focus starting in 1997 and that being more of a focus. All right. Hey, Brandon. Uh, so finally, I'd like to talk about some question and answer systems, uh, which are a little bit more modern topic in NLP. So a lot has changed uh, since I created that Shiny app in 2020. In particular, generative AI has taken off in the last year or so. And my guess is that you're probably, you know, a, a more informed audience about text anal analysis than the general public, but uh, ChatGPT has really captured public attention. And I think it's what a lot of people probably think of when they think of, you know, the use of language and AI. Large language models have been around for quite a while, but they have really accelerated with uh, new models and tools coming out all the time, including models specialized for assisting with writing of computer code, as well as for financial and medical use cases. For those of you that are unfamiliar, large language models are deep neural networks that are trained on vast amounts of data. The scale of the models and the scale of their training data lead to uh, really cool emergent capabilities like their ability to summarize or paraphrase text or even respond in a conversational manner. Uh, the hype around these models is so high and uh, right now and, and so is the concern about the harm that they might cause. Uh, the text data that these models are trained on contains years of human biases and they may be reflected in the model's output. And they will also produce realistic sounding text whether they are correct or not, uh, what are often referred to as hallucinations. Uh, because of the uncertainty surrounding these models and how these and how they're commonly served through web tools, uh, BLS has actually banned what was referred to as AI processes, which uh, is largely meant to refer to these large language language models uh, used for generative AI, and in particular those ones that you need to access through an API or a web portal like ChatGPT. Uh, because this project isn't part of my regular BLS work and because I wanted to learn more about these models, I took this as an opportunity to use these large language models to summarize the ASA presidential address text on my home computer, not on my work computer. So one application of large language models is question and answer text extraction. So in this format, the user can provide large chunks of text, and then they can query that text in a question response format uh, to extract what they're looking for. Uh, on the right here, you see an example where we have some text about uh, some something that OSHA did, and we might want to know, uh, you know, who who it was that received the citation or where it is that the that company is located, and presumably you would want to. Make sure that if you ask a question for which there isn't an answer, it will let you know that there isn't a, a reasonable example. And sometimes you do this through setting up thresholds. Our uh, census of fatal occupational injuries at BLS uses something like this where they get news articles and they query those news articles uh, about work-related fatalities for the information that the survey is interested in, who was injured, what caused the injury, and so forth. So this is a, a popular area now within, um, within natural language processing. And these newer, larger models uh, can uh, not only uh, extract text, they can extract sort of full ideas and they can provide conversational responses. Some of the less sophisticated models can only extract text as it's seen in the uh, input text, like you see on the right side here. Uh, you can't ask yes or no questions to it, but some of these new models, you can ask yes or no type questions and it'll be able to answer those reasonably well. So one such new large language model is the Llama 2 model, which was open sourced by Meta, formerly known as Facebook, in uh, early July. So Llama 2 is similar to ChatGPT in that it responds to prompts from a user or a programmer, and it provides conversational responses. It's different, however, in that it was open sourced and was able to be downloaded and run locally. So I downloaded it and ran it locally on my computer. It's a very large model and it barely fit onto my computer, but I was able to get it to run and uh, perform some of these operations. Uh, so one caveat uh, before I get to the findings, I'll be using the model to summarize the presidential addresses. 
but there is a practical limit to what these models can take in, in terms of input text of about 3000 words uh, or uh, what are referred to in uh, the space as uh, about 4,000 tokens. Cause some of those words get split up into multiple words. Uh, punctuation is counted as a token and sometimes spaces between words are counted as tokens. So most of the speeches are longer than 3,000 words. Uh, in fact, there was the one that I pointed out that was 16,000 words. So the results that you'll see are only going to be based on a piece of the text. And I found uh, for summarization, I initially fed in the first 3,000 words and it got a lot of like the, the speaker, you know, talks about thanking the audience. And so not very informative stuff. So I switched and fed in the last 3,000 words and I got a lot more uh, practical responses out of it. So uh, the talk uh, of the, or the title of this talk refers to issues in the field of statistics. So my first use case for uh, what to prompt the model to do was to ask it for the single most important issue facing the field of statistics that that year's president talked about. The ASA presidents rarely explicitly say, this is the most important issue. So this is a difficult task, even I think for human readers to do. So when providing the text uh, from Wendy's 2020 presidential address and asking this question, the model returns text saying that the author believes that the most important issue facing the field of statistics is the relationship between data science and statistics. And I don't think I would say that that's Wendy's main theme of her talk, but I can see where the model might have gotten that from. For example, this text from the address talking about the relationship between data science and statistics. So it's, it's possible to see where the connection between the response and the input text. Oh, okay, wait, Brandon, can I can I interrupt? Yeah. <laughs> because while, yes, maybe that doesn't reflect the actual content of the speech, I do think that's an important issue. And I probably, and I did think it, I still think it's an important issue. Mm -hmm. um, and probably especially uh, back in 2020. So that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Um, wow, it's almost like it read, read my mind. But... <laughs> So I just want to make sure I I understand the prompt. So the, where you have the bracket speech text, that would be the 3,000 words of the speech. Correct. That's correct? Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And for Karen Cafedar's 2019 address uh, that we saw earlier, the same question returns that having an impact on the world is the most important issue facing the field of statistics. And that's pretty on the nose given lar that that largely reflects what the title of her talk was about impacts on society. So I took this same prompt and I applied it to all 109 presentations. I then uh, reviewed the short outputs that the model provided and tried to extract some themes across all of the presentations. And I'll present those uh, now. So. Uh, the most frequent theme in the output from the LAMA 2 model in terms of what it found uh, as the, the most important issue is the tension between applied and theoretical statistics. So across more than 70 years and a dozen presentation, the model returned statements suggesting that that year's president talked about the need for statisticians to be more involved in real world problems and informing policy. Another common set of issues relates to concerns about the lack of trust in or visibility of the contributions of statistics. So back in 1952, that was worded as, you know, and again, this is the output of the model, that the lack of public trust and confidence in statistics, which has led to the misuse of statistics is in, in important decision-making processes. And in 2014, uh, the issue of visibility and outreach is crucial for the field's continued relevance and strength. So this was a, a you know over you know a sixty year or so time span. Another theme amongst the important issues returned by the model is the need to improve communications to non-statisticians and increase statistical literacy in the general public. And uh, you know the nineteen twenty one wording of that was make statistical demonstrations more intelligible to the man on the street. And in twenty twelve, uh, almost ninety years later 
make statistical methods and contributions accessible and visible to a broader audience. And similar to what we saw with the frequencies and the topic models, there is a more than 100 year tradition of highlighting the need to adapt to new methodologies, technologies, and techniques. So all the way back in 1923, was, there was already some indigestion about developing new methods for analyzing and interpreting data in the face of an increasingly complex and rapidly changing world. And you know, as recently as 2018, adapt to a rapidly changing informatics landscape. So things are always rapidly changing. That's the, the constant. Okay, Brandon, I have to chime in here too, because I find that amazing for 1923. <laughs> I mean, you're right that, because um, we've heard that that phrase, you know, complex and rapidly changing world. So um, I guess it's, we think that it's new currently, but I guess it isn't anything really new. Maybe just the, the aspect of it changes, but it's something we continue to uh, wrestle with. Yeah, always new frontiers. <laughs> yeah, but yet still, but still old ones, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so uh, to wrap up here, um, these three methods, word frequencies, topic modeling, and QA systems can provide insight into the content of individual speeches. Uh, we also saw how they allow for a comparison across a corpus of documents to spot themes and topics and trends. And while ChatGPT and large language models might be the new hot thing, the more simplistic, traditional, and easily explainable methods still provide value. And they provide value in just understanding whether those uh, new methods are doing what you might expect them to do. Uh, projects like this one, uh, that have low stakes are a great way to learn about the benefits and limitations of these large language models. And uh, I'll put this link in the chat in a minute so everybody can go visit the app, but I encourage you to, to go and explore the app. Um, this is you know the uh, page where it shows uh, you know the word frequencies and how you might explore the word frequencies for an individual uh, address. It also has, a separate page for looking at the word frequencies over time. The uh, content or the output of the topic models is also listed. And also there's a, on this uh, third tab here, there's the, the topics through time. And then finally, uh, a new addition this year is the inclusion of the output from the LAMA2 models. So I not only prompted for the single most important issue facing the field of statistics, which is over here on the right side, I also prompted the model to extract uh, five key takeaways from each address. And I encourage you to check those out and compare them to the outputs of the other methods and see if they're returning sort of usable responses. And I look forward to questions and uh, you know one, Thing I thought I could do here quickly is just uh, bring up the app um, and hopefully it loads. Yeah, and just to show here, the again, the one thing that I thought was kind of neat, it's not doing that, by the way, the large language model, it's not doing this inf inference here. I, you know, uh, did it and stored it in a database and now I bring it up here. So uh, the uh, shiny apps wouldn't be able to handle the size of the Llama 2 model here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it provides these uh, nice takeaways and I think it does a pretty good job. So with that, uh, thank you. I look forward to your questions. Wow, thank you, Brandon. That is fabulous. Um, did last time I think you had the code also on GitHub. Um, it, is the updated code there too somewhere? I have not put the updated code up on GitHub. I don't know if I have access to the ASA GitHub anymore. Uh, uh, Sam Tyner gave me access before, but uh, the the code for the app itself hasn't changed much. It was more of the inputs that have changed. And I don't provide a lot of that code, but what I do provide oh, is here where I talk about, I provide some code here for how you might go about using these things. So this is probably more useful if you wanted sort of practical implementation of these things. Uh, so like for the topic modeling, I did that in R using basically this code. 
so that this might be of more use. And that's on the about the data page. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, maybe you and I could um, chat in the future about, because uh, I think I can get access to GitHub. Okay. Um, yeah, now that you reminded me, because I think it was on the stack computing section. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, GitHub site. This was very, very interesting because I, I'm I'm always fascinated by by um, like changes through time, and so so being able to uh, you know kind of take a look at look at these things through time is is uh, super interesting. Uh, while people are are coming up with questions, um, I have another question. I seem to remember, unless I dreamt it, um, somebody recently presenting an approach for automatic, I'm going to put that in quotes, like automatic um, topic labeling. So in other words, uh, you know, natural language processing, I'll call it that, or text analysis processing approach mm -hmm. that would assign a label. Have you heard of that? Or, because I don't know, was it GASP or? Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember. I know that, that that's a constant issue is, like when you do want to do topic modeling, the, the most burdensome part is like the topics all, like each time you run it, the topics end up in a different order and it, it you might remove like one stop word and then it changes everything. And so it's very difficult to sort of automate the process of that in a workflow. So that's like the one sort of very manual piece of, of building that into a workflow. So it would be really nice uh, one place where I've been using topic modeling uh, is sort of experimenting with is with uh, downloading R packages, uh, like the the metadata for R packages, and looking at the descriptions and trying to come up with topic models for the the packages. So you could look at a at a package and it would say that this is mostly related to data visualization or this is mostly related to to modeling or something, and you know the packages change every day. And so I, I download the new packages every day, but I don't update the topic models every day because that's such a burdensome limitation. So it would be nice to be able to automate that. Uh, I've, I have seen some people, uh, the, the, there's a package in Python called Bertopic, where it uses the Bert model from uh, Google to do topic modeling. And essentially what it does to label the topics is it just takes the first five words that load most highly and it concatenates them together. It says, here you go, here's your label. And that may be a reasonable solution as well, but, but it would be nice to use maybe these large language models to say, and I actually did that in a couple of cases just because I wanted to learn what ChatGPT would do. And sometimes it's more creative than I am where I'd say like, here's 10 words, what do all these words have in common? And use that as the the topic label. Yeah, that's interesting. I never I didn't think about using a large language model to to actually assign the the topic label. But you're right; that is a, a somewhat frustrating and manual process and subjective, I guess, too. That about you know how do you assign labels to the topics or understand what the topics are about because just of the things that you've already you've already mentioned. Um, I see we have Kevin has his hand up. I'm sorry, I missed that. Go ahead. <laughs> nope, no problem. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Brandon. This is a cool topic. Uh, appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, I had a question for you specifically about your foray into using Llama 2, and you said it required 32 gigabytes of RAM even just to load the model. And then I guess I was wondering like what the actual running of the model is like in on a laptop, does it uh, is it as quick as like in the API for uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT, or does it uh, take time to generate the response? Like, what is the the computational time like on running the model? I understand I, I the, 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 the size constraints. Yeah, yeah, I had variable experiences with it, and the other sort of caveat is I was running it on a fairly new Mac that uses Apple Silicon. And so mm -hmm. if you have like a NVIDIA GPU or something that might give you a better experience because more things are built to run on that. And I had some issue with like, it would fill up the, the memory and it wouldn't sort of dump after each 
iteration. So it'd slowly fill up the memory. And so it wouldn't only just take up the RAM, it would start putting some of the, the memory onto the hard drive. And, and at some point it would collapse and I'd have to restart the kernel and, and run it again. And so it was, it was pretty onerous, uh, but there's a lot of different things that you can do. And I wasn't sort of like, this was my first foray into that, um, that, uh, there's what they call quantization is a big thing now. So all of these models come with like 32 decimal places, something like that. And you can easily like truncate that to 16 uh, with Apple Silicon. But then there's in, uh, I might be getting those numbers wrong, but in, uh, you know, for Windows use cases or NVIDIA use cases, I've seen like you can get it down to like eight decimal places and it still gives you reasonable like accuracy without all of those decimal places for each of these uh you know uh parameters that it's trying to use and it uses seven billion parameters for the smallest version of the llama 2 so you can imagine if you can truncate you know eight ten characters from seven billion things like that's going to shrink the size of it a lot so like there's just a lot of things you can do uh to help improve that uh depending on your use case if you have something that's not sensitive. Another thing that I've seen a lot of people doing is using the free compute on Google Colab to, to run these things. And they have yeah. you know, so, some GPU and some TPU, blah, 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 like uh, stuff to help with that. But the, in terms of the in inference time, it was taking anywhere from like five, six seconds up to five or six minutes. It was just sort of variable. And I never quite figured out why that would be the huh. case. And all mm -hmm. of those things, but mm -hmm. sometimes I would get on a roll and it would be maybe like 20 to 30 seconds per inference, but it's definitely not real time. Got it. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting that it, you can cut down the memory footprint just by the precision. But I was I I think that there's relatively fixed number of flops that's occurring uh for the the inference part. Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, all right, any other um, any other questions? I'm trying to look at the chat because I'm not very good at this chat. Am yeah, I, I missing uh, Stas's comment, which is which is really great because I always tell people too when you're thinking about finding an initial data set to get into. It's, it's good to find one that you know and you have inferences about, which is definitely not the case for me in this particular data set. I don't know a lot about the history of statistics, but that, that's great because when you do see those sorts of patterns, you can be like, okay, that makes sense because I know about this sort of thing. And so, yeah, finding data sets that you're familiar with and you have intuitions about is a great way to kind of get started with these things. Yeah, and one of the... Uh... And Stas mentioned this too in the in the chat about because you you found this that in the 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 early speeches everything not everything but but a lot of the um, speeches were about um, economics and uh, J John Abowd uh, when he was here at the census he said yeah they were like this you know hand in hand statistics and economists I mean there was really no separation they were together um, in those early years and then. Uh, they, you know, things kind of split or our statistics broadened its uh, scope uh, a, a lot as we saw. So, um, yeah, and I, and I was always kind of struck by when you, you know, the, the, the time difference, I guess, or the history that you saw with the words of, you know, using data science and then, um, big data and computers that that was uh i mean that's like right on the money in terms of like our understanding of the historical development of um computers and technology so mm. uh yeah just super interesting um yeah, and I, I like that that was interesting about Janet Norwood too, of course, <laughs> being the commissioner of the BLS and, and her, her speech. And who was who was the president in 1997? Maybe you mentioned it, the one who first mentioned data science. I don't remember if I put it in here. Yeah, but they're prescient in, <laughs> in mentioning that. Uh yeah, I guess I didn't put it in here. Uh 
Yeah, I don't, don't recall. Oh, wait, I guess we have the app open. Let's find out. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> 1997, uh, John. Oh, Kettenring. Okay, that's not surprising. That's not surprising. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, I really Brandon has some really interesting um, metadata about the 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 conferences, like the venues and so on. So that yeah. that I found super interesting. Yeah, some stuff about you know locations and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to figure out what to do with um, you know these last two years, and so I put it like out in the ocean <laughs> for <laughs> uh, for these virtual ones, but. Yeah, up in space, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Well, thank you, Brandon. But before we go, um, two things. Um. Yes, we will have the uh the recording. We will have the session uh posted. Uh, Donna will send me the link, and then I'll get it put up on our YouTube channel. Oh, I should have had a link to that. Put it in the chat. But we do have a YouTube channel. Um, and if you don't know where it is, uh, you could send me an email. Um, it's uh, wendy.l.martinez at census.gov, and I will send you the link to it. But you could probably just search on YouTube for our gubbies, and you should find it. And uh, we encourage you to subscribe. We need subscribers <laughs> to our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, also, uh, Brian, I think you get the prize. Um, he did uh, guess right, or he did let me know what the show was that I was trying to refer to earlier or remember. And it was The Strain. And it was based on a book by Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro? Del Toro? My, my accent's not very good, sorry. But um, yeah, so check it out. Uh, and see if you like it. All right. Anything else before we wrap up? I don't have a, uh, we don't have our topic yet for October, but I have some thoughts. Uh, but if any of you have some thoughts too, we welcome them. Be sure to uh, pass them along to us. But anyway, thank you, Brandon. Yep, anytime. <laughs> yeah, that was fabulous as always. Uh, so thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hey everyone. Let's we all see. sat down.